There are a lot of teams throughout NBA history. Maybe they were good for a season. They had some great memorable moments. Or they were just fun to watch, but they kind of get forgotten about through the years because they didn't really accomplish anything. So we wanted to make a series kind of going over these teams, refreshing everyone's memories and just breaking them down in depth. Yeah, they're not really that remarkable. People don't really remember them, but for some reason they've just stuck with us. And the first team is the 2015 Atlanta Hawks. Before we start talking about the 2015 Atlanta Hawks, please give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you never miss out on any new videos. So coming into this season, the Hawks were not expected to be that good. Their over-under was 42 and a half. They were plus 12,500 odds to win the title. So basically, if you were throwing money on them, you were just throwing it away. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, they were coming off an eight-seeded season. They did take the Pacers to seven, but that was more about the Pacers just being dysfunctional than it was the Hawks being anything, you know, interesting or good. And their offseason, I mean, they lost Lou Williams. They drafted Adrian Payne. And that was basically it. They brought in Kent Bazemore. But is that even an upgrade? You lose... Lou Williams and you bring in Kent Bazemore like I don't really think so I wouldn't call it an upgrade <laughs> yeah the only thing they had going for them is the East during this year was just completely open you had LeBron he was going to the Cavs his first year with the Cavs Kyrie and Kevin Love would have to adjust to playing with them they'd never been in the playoffs before the Pacers Paul George was out the entire year with that gruesome leg injury and there was no one else really in the East like you had the Bulls with no one rose past their prime Celtics and Bucks were still young there was no other real contenders in the East this yeah, year yeah because the the West was the juggernaut conference. The fucking Spurs were coming off a championship and they were the sixth seed. That's insane. That's fucking stupid is what it is. Didn't they win like 55 games too? Yeah, sixth seed, 55 games. That's ridiculous. Being a Western Conference team sucks. But somehow this Hawks team, during the regular season at least, was just insane. And really it's because they just had a completely balanced starting five. You had Jeff Teague, who was like your playmaker, scorer, creative point guard. Kyle Korver, just knockdown shooter. Damari Carroll, perfect 3 and D for the NBA at the time. Then you had Paul Millsap for your post offense and Al Horford for your post defense. It's one of those starting lineups that just doesn't have a weakness. Like you could point out like, oh, Korver's not a great defender. Millsap wasn't a great defender. But like in terms of like, a unit itself, you have everything there and there's no redundancies. There's no two players that are like, oh, these guys play the exact same so they're going to overlap. Like, it's just a really well constructed starting lineup. And on the bench, I mean, they had some dudes on the bench too. Dennis Schroeder, Kent Bazemore, Mike Scott, Perro Antich. Shout out Bronze Beast, Perro Antich in like 2K15, I think? 14? Yeah, he was some, every Something three. like that. Tabo Cephalosha was a defensive stopper. Shelvin Mack, John Jenkins, Mike Muscala. They had a pretty balanced team. Yeah, and this team was called the Spurs of the East. And they earned that nickname. They did but that's still such a funny nickname looking back. But really that was because Mike Budenholzer, he had a lot of experience under Pop. He spent 17 years as assistant coach for Pop. Picked up four rings? Yeah, that's insane. Obviously he won a championship with the Bucks in 2021. Did get fired this year, but still a great coach. Underrated coach at the time. And Bud, I, he had these dudes hooping. They got off to kind of a crappy start, seven and six. And then they went 33 and two over their next 35 games. They went 17 and 0 in January. And this is something I think is dumb as hell. <laughs> Their entire starting lineup was the Eastern Conference Player of the Month. I'm sorry, that's stupid. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. You know, they were just all balling out together. It was a team effort. Then you give it to group. one of them. <laughs> give it to one of them. This is dumb. It was corny as hell, but I loved it. It just showed that this team, it was a team. There wasn't just one guy. I mean, Paul Millsap was their leading scorer. He averaged less than 17 points a game. They had a complete team. It then, wasn't just one guy. Then call him the Eastern Conference Team of the Month. It's the Player of the Month. Fun. This team also, another fun fact, they had four all-stars. One of only nine teams to do that. The other teams, 2018 Warriors, 2017 Warriors, 2011 Celtics, 2006 Pistons, the 1998 Lakers, the 1983 76ers, and then you have the 75 and 62 Celtics. Cue up the Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other song. I mean, come on now. Doesn't 
be long. Also, after the All-Star break, Kyle Korver had that one game against the Bucks. He dropped 11 points in 65 seconds. One of the best heat check moments in NBA history. It's my personal favorite. Especially the one where he comes around the screen, a guy's right in his face, he just shoots it and drains it like it's nothing. Love it. So the Hawks finished the season 60 and 22. Best record in the East. The only problem is, before the playoffs begin, Thabo Cephalo should be injured by NYPD. They would tackle him outside of a nightclub and break his leg in the process. Why did they tackle? Why? Why? I, they, they had the wrong guy. He didn't do anything. He was just outside the nightclub, got tackled. He didn't get paid a big check, $4.5 million for this, but still not worth missing an entire year of basketball. Yeah, that's f***ed up. And before we get into playoffs, we have to mention we were watching back the highlights. What was so weird about this year, they did like a half rebrand. The court, at least the logo on the court was rebranded, but they still had those old Hawks jerseys. They had the old Hawks lettering on the court. Why did they do that? It's like they got halfway through the rebrand and then the season started. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, we're out of time. Well, we'll just play this season out. Like, yeah, they brought back the old, like, retro Hawks logo from the 80s and then kept, like, the mid to early 2000s Hawks stuff where everything has to look futuristic. So, like, it's such a clash of styles. <laughs> it looks awful. Yeah, it did look And awful. I'm not a big fan of the retro Hawks logo to begin with because it just looks like red Pac-Man to me. So watching the Hawks this era is, like, painful on my eyes. Yeah. Speaking of painful, this Nets team they played against oh got boy. the A seed. They won 38 games. They were just trash. KG was out. He only played half the season. You had Joe Johnson, Brooke Lopez, Darren Williams, Thaddeus Young. Just holding on to the dream of that. Joe Johnson, right. Darren Williams team at this point. Had some no-namers. We were watching back the highlights of some of these playoff games. Who the hell is Earl Clark? Someone in the comments is going to know who it is, but we sure as hell didn't. Markel Brown? Like, not Marquez Brownlee, the tech YouTuber. Who the <laughs> hell is Markel Brown? I don't know. <laughs> Still kept it close for the first two games in this series, though. Game one, the Hawks won by seven, led by Korver. Game two, they only won by five. How the hell did the Nets keep this close? Because the Hawks were a team that in the regular season operated at maximum capacity. They were not a typical, like, championship contender that's operating at, like, 85, 90% capacity in the regular season. They were hitting their max. So when they get to the playoffs, they're like, well, we don't have another gear to go to, so we're just going to grind these games out. So, yeah, going back to Brooklyn, the Nets win game three, 91-83. And then shout out Darren Williams for game four. 35 points, seven threes. I saw we were watching the highlights for this game. There's one like contested deep three he takes late in the game and just swishes it. I'm like, God damn, Darren Williams. Throwing back to when he used to be an all-star. <laughs> right. They came back to Atlanta. They won game five by 10. And then they went back to broken game six and kind of hammered the Nets. So, you know, they closed about in six. But still, a 38 win Nets team that was about to be detonated the following year gave you this much of a challenge. Yeah, this should have been a sweep. So all the people kind of myself, I'm sure you at the time too, thought this team were frauds going to the playoffs. I didn't think this team was a fraud. I knew this team was <laughs> right, a fraud. Exactly. This just confirmed everyone's opinions on that. Boy, round two, they didn't do too much to disprove any of those thoughts. Like, the Wizards march into Atlanta in game one. They walk out of Atlanta with a win. That is just ridiculous. John Wall had 13 assists. He injured his wrist in this game. He would not play the next three games. And Beal drops 28 on you. Come on now. Bad look for the Hawks. Come on. They did bounce back in game two. They won 106-90. But again, like we said, John Wall didn't play. Damari Carroll, Paul Millsap, Jeff Teague combined for basically 60. So solid bounce back game. Then game three, everyone remembers this game. John Wall was still out. Ramon Sessions played like absolute Paul Millsap, he didn't start this game due to flu-like symptoms. That makes no sense. Yeah, that doesn't me. make any sense. If you're going to play, just start. But we all remember this game because that Paul Pierce just insane game winner. He had, what, like three guys all over him when he hit that. It's eye. one of the funniest game winners you'll ever see. Like, he has a guy wide open in the corner for a three. <laughs> just completely ignores him. And just, yeah, banks in a crazy jumper with three guys in his face. Weirdly enough, Al Horford is not on the floor for this. I mean, I, I would have liked to have him for more defense. Maybe he... Maybe if yeah, he was he the fourth the guy. Yeah, he would have been the difference. <laughs> and then the legendary interview after the game, Chris Broussard to Paul Pierce is like, Did you call Bank? I called Game. He didn't call Bank. No. That was a lucky no shot. shot. Lucky as hell, but he hit it. Yeah, he did. And at this point, if you didn't think the Hawks were frauds before, they looked like absolute frauds at this point. They came out in game four, though. They got a much-needed win. Now, this game down the stretch, a little controversial, because Pierce had a wide-open three to tie the game, and you can make a strong argument Demari Carroll did not let him land. And then on the very next play, Hawks inbound the ball, and Kyle Korver clearly travels. But the Hawks ended up winning the game, and we got a tie series going back to game five in Atlanta. 
Yeah, John Wall was back for this game. So if you're the Wizards, you're thinking, well, we basically played the Hawks to a stalemate without Wall. So now that we got him back, can we take advantage? Well, they almost did. They were up by one late in the game, but Al Hortford had a put back game winner. And the Hawks, again, they're just kind of escaping by like the skin of their teeth in a lot of these games. Like there's one convincing win in this entire playoff run for the Hawks. But game six, they would end up closing it out. Another super close game. Funny fact about this game, the Wizards at one point in the third quarter had 39 points. That's like classic 2005 NBA <laughs> yeah, basketball. what the hell? This was 2015. The Hawks were up by 15 in the third quarter. It seemed like this series was over, but then the Wizards storm back late. They take the lead late. And this is another Paul Pierce moment. He nearly had another one hit three, but it didn't count. It was in his fingertips with like 0.2 seconds left. You know, as much as I don't like Paul Pierce, I'm really mad this shot didn't count because it's an incredible shot. And the Hawks would advance to the conference finals for the first time in 45 years. Yikes. I thought the Blazers 19 year drought <laughs> yeah. that we broke a couple years ago was bad. 45 years just to get back <laughs> to the conference finals. There's some 50 year old Hawks fan during this that was like five <laughs> when they made the conference finals the last time didn't even remember it. So the Hawks, they make it to the conference finals. They're playing against Cleveland. I don't think anybody expected the Hawks to win this <laughs> series and win it. They did not but we'll go slowly. I don't think anyone expected them to win, but at the same time, Kevin Love was out because Kelly Olenek basically ripped out his shoulder. Kyrie Irving would play game one. He'd get injured and play game four. So you'd think LeBron James, Matthew Delvadova, Timothy Mozgov, Tristan Thompson, if you're a 61 team, you should be at least put up a fight. You're playing against LeBron. Okay. That's Fair my point. counterpoint. Fair point. It's all I need. I mean, he scored 31 in game one, but he was not the MVP for the Cavs this game because J.R. Smith was just on another level with some of these heat check shots. This is one of those classic J.R. games where he can't miss from three. And also, a lot of times J.R., when he's just cooking from three, he'll be hitting threes like off the catch. He was hitting threes off the dribble in this game. <laughs> and that's how you know you're Game two, the Hawks, they hold the Cavs to 94 points. Problem is they only scored 80. This, this is what I was saying earlier. Like they played to maximum capacity in the regular season. Like they don't have another gear to go to in the playoffs. They just don't. They can't score. So they're going into game three down 2-0. And you know what? They gave the Cavs a fight in this game. Quite literally because Al Horford got ejected for elbowing <laughs> Matthew Della Vidova. So you lose Al Horford right before halftime. Kyle Korver didn't even play in this game or game four because he sprained his ankle. So you're down two of your all-stars. Think about that for a second. <laughs> yeah, Kyle Corbin, not Horford, two of your all-stars. And you know what? They battled back. Jeff Teague balled the f*** out in this game, had 30 points. The problem is LeBron hit some big shots down the stretch in overtime, and then Shelvin Mack thought he had a main character moment at the end, <laughs> missed two threes in overtime, and they'd end up losing. Got a second one that was wide open and missed it badly. <laughs> yeah, kind of feel bad for him, but at the same time, what the hell is he doing taking those shots? It's a team effort, man. True. Whoever's open to takes the shot. They don't need a superstar like LeBron James who's going to score 37 points, grab 18 <laughs> rebounds, and dish out 13 assists. They do it by committee. In game four, this game just wasn't even close. Kyrie was back. LeBron was the leading scorer in this game, only had 23. But the Cavs had six players in double figures. And funny fact about this game, Kendrick Perkins, Brendan Haywood, Mike Miller, and Sean Marion all played minutes for the Cavs this game. It's like a who's who of role players from like 2008. The funny thing is, like, even though this team got bounced out in kind of embarrassing fashion, it's still probably the best Hawks team ever if you're not counting, like, the Bob Pettit St. Louis Hawks era. Like, I know they won a title way back when the earth was still cooling, but, like... <laughs> I mean, this is the Hawks franchise record for wins. Like, yeah. It's it's still a very good team. It's just, it kind of sucks that they had to get demolished in the playoffs by Cleveland. Yeah, the fact that they got destroyed in the playoffs and they got these four all-stars and they're just completely out of place in that group. They'll just get memed on forever. But it was still a great season. It was some beautiful basketball. Kyle Korver had one of the best shooting seasons ever. Just kind of pathetic how it ended. And the other problem with this team is like, they didn't follow it up at all. Like the next season, they regressed big time down to 48 wins, got swept by the Cavs again this time in the second round. The next year, they lose Al Horford to the Celtics. They replace him with Dwight. <laughs> yeah, that worked. They won 43 games. And then, like I said, by the 2017-2018 season, they had a 24-win season. That's ridiculous. Like, they went from 60 wins to 24 wins in three years. Yeah, it was a fun team. It was some beautiful basketball. They had some fun players, humble guys. But it was just never going to last. They were vanilla ice. They were a one-hit wonder.
So what do you guys think of the 2015 Atlanta Hawks? Will they just be completely forgotten about in like 20 years? If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving me a like. And hey, while you're here, check out some of our other content as well. And don't forget to subscribe to Synthetic Sports.